last but not least is our guest speaker, the Chief Economist at Bank of Queensland, Mr. Peter Mugton. Peter has held this position for almost 10 years. Prior to that, he worked at the Federal Treasurer in Canberra, Bankers Trust and CBA. He co-authors reports on the Australian and Chinese financial system that gains significant international media attention. Tonight, Peter will provide us an economic update looking into 2024 locally and globally, followed with a Q&A session with me. Welcome, Peter. Thanks very much, Angelina, and thanks very much um, for the invite. I, I actually couldn't set it nice words if I had written them myself. Um, so look, what I end up doing is going straight to um, uh, my presentation. Um, of course, in any presentation, particularly if you have an economist, there's plenty of slides to see, lots of data, a lot of charts. I'm not going to disappoint you today, but inevitably, when you get a presentation, there's always one thing that stands out, and the next slide is that slide, which is something I want you to keep very firmly in your mind. Um, there it is. This is the most important slide you'll see. It's general sort of advice <laughs> I'm providing you all in terms of the macro economy. I'm going, to, I'm going to go through three things today. I'm going to touch on the US, why it is outperforming, and a couple of quick issues. The second one is China. It's of, uh, been a increasing um, of importance for the domestic economy. I want to talk about a, a couple of issues associated with China. And the third thing I want to quickly touch on is Australia. Where's Australia at? What are the drivers? And what is some of the outlook? And what are the implications for interest rates? So they're the three things I want to uh, go through quickly today. So first of all, on, on the US, the US economy has done a lot better than what people thought. And certainly it's it's been the strongest of all the developed economies, probably only really India has stood out to be a stronger economy uh, globally in uh, over the last year or two. Why has the US been such a strong economy? And it was actually an issue raised recently before uh, with uh, Governor Bullock uh, in the, at Parliament. Probably the main run is simply the consumer, and the consumer is so strong because they've got so much extra money they could spend, certainly more. Uh, the growth in their incomes has been a lot stronger than uh, a lot of peer economies. Why has it been strong? Well. The US economy has been strong, employment's been strong, wages growth has been up. But to be honest, that's been the case in most of the economy. So there's been no real unusual story about the US. One is that inflation in the US came down quicker than other economies. So that uh, inflation tax, which was a big issue for all consumers, uh, became less of an issue quicker in the US. And the second one, though, is interest payments. Like in the US, we all know the famous 30-year fixed rate mortgages. Uh, if you've taken it out, you've still got about 27 years to go in terms of your uh, your rate if you took out your mortgage during COVID. And if you look at the interest payments paid for by US consumers, it declined a lot through COVID. It has picked up, but where we are today is actually now lower than it was pre-COVID. Right? So one reason is consumers are spending a lot. They're spending a lot because they've got a lot more money because of uh, lower inflation. A second one is the interest payments have hit them nowhere near as hard, certainly as here, but even the case in uh, most most other economies. And this is the case, by the way, not only for households. If I put up the same chart for businesses, because businesses in the US can borrow again for longer terms, typically in other economies, their interest payments relative to their profits is also still quite low. So the how, uh, how households and businesses borrow is a big part of the game. Of course, the flip side of the coin is that new borrowers are not borrowing quite as much because the interest rates have gone up. And we see that some impact on, in, in the US housing market. A third big reason about why um, the US consumers have been spending is because they've been happy to A, reduce, not, not save as much as they used to, and B, reduce what saving they've actually got. And they've done those two things a lot more aggressively than other, other peer economies. So they've had more income, they've been happy to save less, happy to run down their savings, and the fact that um, their interest payments haven't gone up. So all very, very good reasons about why the consumer in the US has been a lot stronger than everywhere else. The final big reason about why the US economy is in a far better shape is that their government is giving so much more fiscal support to its economy than virtually than any other economy. And you can see that in the right-hand chart, the size of the budget deficit in the US relative to, uh, to, to all other economies. So these are all the big reasons why the US economy has been a lot stronger than other economies in 2023. Uh, is likely to be stronger again in 2024. Yes, it's the fact that consumer may not be spending quite as much because its employment growth is slowing. They may not be running down their savings quite as much. So that is true. It is also true that government's probably not going to provide quite as much support to the economy 
but it's still likely to be true that the US economy is going to enjoy a decent year this year uh, in terms of its economy. Now, of course, that's a bit of an issue in terms of for the Federal Reserve, the US Central Bank, because inflation is slowing, but not quite enough yet. Its economy has softened, has weakened a little bit, but nowhere near quite as much for the factors I've, I've put forward today. And so that whole question about when the US is going to start cutting rates and by how much uh, is a big, big question for our financial markets this year. And my answer to that, by the way, is not much, that much different for where financial markets are. They'll start sometime around the middle of the year and probably only do about one and a half to two percentage points in this rate reduction uh, cycle. This chart, by the way, is for the short term, shows why the US economy is strong right now. But it does leave that longer term question. How long can the US run these big budget deficits at a time when its government debt's high? Now, I don't think this is going to be an issue for financial markets this decade, but at some point in time, the US political system will have to come up to an answer to that question. It just does not, does not look like a provided answer anytime soon. So the first point is that the US economy is uh, pretty strong, um, is likely to remain strong, albeit not quite as uh, robust as it was in 2023. The next one, the next thing I'll quickly focus on is China. Um, we sort of, most of us actually know the Chinese story has been publicised pretty well. The bottom line is that the housing sector experienced amazing growth in China. And there's no real surprise in that 500 million people over the last three decades moved from the country to the city. 500 million people. So that 500 million people we had to find new homes for. And of course, that led to an absolute massive housing investment boom. But what we also know is that the population growth in China has slowed sharply in recent years. And in actual fact, starting from last year, it started to go backwards. So all of a sudden, in aggregate, China started to need a few lesser homes. Now, if you look at the amount of housing investment in China, it is four to five times the amount of investment that Australia does. Four to five times relative to the size of the economy, the amount of investment that Australia does. Now, for a while, that mattered, that made sense, 500 million people going from country to city, but it makes a whole lot less sense now when the Chinese population going backwards, and as we know in Australia, our population growth still remains pretty strong. So what we can see is that green line in that chart will have to come down to at least the orange, if not below it. So we know that one part of the economy in China must be slowing quite sharply. That's one part must go so sharply. And that matters a lot for China because 30% of its growth over the last decade has been from this housing investment. So that's issue one. Where does China soak up that missing growth that it's absolutely going to miss out on because of the change of resources away from the housing sector? One of the other implications from not only its very strong investment to housing, but more generally, its very strong um, investment over on its economy is a lot of that is funded by debt. But if you look at this chart, China's debt to GDP ratio, and that's on the bottom uh, axis there, is basically well and truly above where it should be given its income level. If you give it its, in if you draw that line, uh, sort of an imaginary line up from China up to where that dotted line is, it basically says that China's income should be about three times its current size, income per person should be three times its current size, given the amount of debt it has in its economy. So, the amount of debt in China is a huge issue, and that is a fundamental reason about why the, you know a lot of uh, investors sort of say, why is the Chinese government doing a whole lot more, borrowing a whole lot more to support its economy? The main reason is this, because already, from an aggregate perspective, China has too much debt. So that answers the question about why the Chinese government hasn't been as aggressive as what people have been thinking about to support its economy. But they have been doing some things to support its economy. I, I mentioned earlier on about that missing growth well, one of the things that it has done over the last 15 years is say to themselves, where will the growth of the future be? Uh, electric vehicles, batteries, solar panels, China all of a sudden dominates the manufacturer of those. And you just have to look about the biggest manufacturers in the world of batteries. China has almost 80% market share. So, of course, that is a big thing for China. It's sort of a helping a little bit to fill in the growth hole created by uh, the slowdown housing. Of course, this massive move towards batteries and so forth, the industries of the future is creating other issues, particularly with countries worried about, well, if that's the future and we've got to rely on China, what does that practically mean for us, right? And so the different governments are basically going through that right now. How much do we want China involved in all the industries of the future, what sort of state should we be having or other countries be having in that? One other 
positive, uh, potential positive for the Chinese economy. So I mentioned there was 500 million people going from the country to the city. If you look at the urbanization rate in China right now, it's increased very sharply for the reasons I just touched on. But still, it is well below what most other developed economies are. Typically, 80 to 90 percent of people live in the cities in all developed economies. That number is about two thirds in China. So in other words, somewhere close to 150 to 200 million people are likely to be moving to cities over the next one to two decades in China. So that means that even though the amount of demand for homes that we've seen over the last 30 years, we're not going to see that again because the overall population growth is slowing. What it does mean is that houses will still need to be built in some particular cities. And what we're starting to see in China is an easing of regulations to enable people to move more freely around their country, including going to countries of the cities. And that'll be one of those other big sort of growth um, drivers of China that they will have. But let me get to the big picture point. All right. The big picture point is this. If you look at the total number of people working in China, so if you go back 15 years ago, it was about five times the size of the number of workers in the US. Right, right now, the Chinese economy is 70 to 80% of the US. Right, uh, If you went back 15 years ago, the number of workers was five times in uh, China than the US. Now, that's declining right, because the number of uh, workers in China has actually been falling for 15 years. And the US is going up, albeit more slowly than it used to be. So the, that ratio will decline against China in coming decades and increasingly so. But let's say go forward, say, 20, 25 years. That number might, instead of be five times as many, will probably be something like four times as many. Right? Then if you go on the left-hand chart, the productivity per person, right? So you, you look at, say, Australia, which is the, the green bar there, it's about 70%. Australia product, uh, work is about 70% as productive as a US one. If you go to Greece, they're about as half as productive as a US worker. In China right now, it's a quarter of as productive. And if you think of all the investments that China's making, the improvements in the education system, its leadership in a number of industries, the growth of patents, all those sorts of things, you've got to say that productivity per person in China has got to be catching up to the US. So let's just say it goes to where Greece is in 20 years' time, half as productive. So you've got four times as many workers, they're as half as productive as the US. The basic math gives you the Chinese economy, therefore, is twice as high, big as the US economy. It's currently 70 to 80% of size. Now, maybe it doesn't get there, but the bottom line point is, is just that the basic maths does say to me that on a two to three decade standpoint, the Chinese economy still is likely to outperform the US's. That's on a two to three decade standpoint. Of course, this whole question, which we touched on at the very start, how China changes its growth, rebalances its growth from housing to other parts of the economy, that is a critical challenge, and that will be a critical challenge for their policymakers for at least the next five years. So the first point is the US economy has been really strong, surprisingly strong um, in 2023. I think it's likely to still have a decent 2024, albeit not quite as good. How strong it will be uh, will be an important issue about how much interest rates decline in, in the US and potentially the world this year. On China, it absolutely is facing some serious short to medium term challenges. But in the big picture, that basic numbers and productivity does say the Chinese economy still got good days ahead. Which brings me to Australia. And where are we as of today? And, you know, I think it's a general consensus of you, and we'll find out more with the Q4 GDP numbers um, when, they, uh, when, they, when, they, when they come out. But we, we, what we'll find out in, in 2023 is that the economy was subtrend, right? And the main reason why the economic growth was subtrend is that disposable income growth after an hour inflation in Australia is the weakest it's been in 40 years. Right? We have not seen anything this aggressively negative for the consumer for 40 years. And in fact, if you look at that left-hand chart, you know, it's been quite negative now for a while and certainly more than the sharp declines that we had in the 70s and the 80s. So you can argue we have not seen anything this bad for the consumer for 60 years. Now, there's an interesting paper that the Reserve Bank uh, wrote probably at the start of 2024 about what are the drivers about those changes in household disposable incomes? Why is why has it been so so weak? Now, one thing we know, it's not to do with the fact it's employment growth or wages. Employment growth, the labour market is the strongest in 50 years. Wages growth is the strongest in 20 years, right? So that's actually been a really strong part of the economy. There's a lot of talk about interest rates, and absolutely that's been a negative uh, for consumers. But if you look at that chart on the right-hand side, those sort of yellowy bars there are no more negative than they were sort of 15 years ago. 
Now, that might seem a little bit strange for those of you that have a mortgage, because for those of you that have a mortgage, what they will sort of say is actually that things are actually really tough right now. That is absolutely true. The reason why those yellow bars aren't quite as big is that for some people, it is really hard and tough for those with a mortgage. For those that don't have a mortgage, in actual fact, they're getting as good a returns as they've seen in terms of deposit rates, et cetera, that they've seen in about 15 to 20 years. So some people are big benefiting big time from the higher rates. Some people are obviously finding it uh, tougher. So those are, the, those are the two reasons that haven't driven this toughness time for the consumers. What has therefore? Well, the first one is just basic inflation, the inflation tax. The inflation tax was basically 8% in 20, uh, 2022. Um, by the end of 2023, the inflation tax get came down to four. The good news is that inflation tax, I'll touch on a bit more, is slowing more. So the first bit is that big tax has been a big, big negative, but it's slowly becoming less so. The second one is because wages growth have been so strong and employment growth has been so strong, that has meant more people pay income tax, but it's also been more people being pushed into higher tax brackets, the so-called wages creep, right? And the big tax payments has been a big negative. And the third one, which is a lot less um, been discussed, is the fact that income outside of interest rates and, and wages has been a lot lower than it has been um, outside the last 10 to 15 years. And that's the way government, and the main reason for that is the, a different way how governments are, are paying people are money. The bottom line from all these charts and the data and information and so forth is that people have got a lot less spare cash flow hanging around to be spending. And what's the obvious outcome if you've got a lot less spare cash flow? The obvious outcome is you spend you spend on less. And the most obvious thing you spend a lot less on is on discretionary items, you know, going out to restaurants, going for entertainment, et cetera, et cetera. And if you see that that's essentially was flat, spending was essentially flat on discretionary spending over the course of 2023. And remember, this chart includes inflation. So if you take out the four to five percent, it actually says that um, spending on discretionary items is down four to five percent of what you actually bought um, last year. And even on non-discretionary items, it is there was quite slap, uh, sharp slowing. And no surprise, if you actually ask households, how are you feeling about your budget? The only time they've been as negative as they are right now was during the 1990s recession, the hardest, toughest recession Australia's faced since the 1930s. Right? So consumers absolutely were feeling it. Now, I don't feel like saying negative, pessimistic things. That's not who I am. So let me just sort of give you a bit of heads up that if you look at that chart close enough, the last little bit, you start to see some improvement. So that's sort of the, the good bits of uh, the good sign. So households have had it very tough for these disposable income reasons. Now, for a while, businesses were fine. For a while, businesses were fine for two reasons. First of all, there was this big increase in prices, big increase in costs. And what businesses were able to do overall across all industries, on average, was pass them all on. Margins for businesses were essentially unchanged. So basically, margins were unchanged. And while each one of us was spending a lot less, there was a whole lot more of us because of very strong population growth. So strong population growth, unchanged margins, Lo and behold, for a period up to the start of 2023, business sentiment was extremely strong about uh, how they saw things. But then gradually over last year, in 2020, uh, gradually over 2023, business sentiment uh, slowly declined. And it's been a very sharp slowing over the course of the back end of 23 into um, the early months of 2024. And why is that? Because eventually that sluggish consumer spending, the stuff that we've already touched on, eventually was playing into businesses. And that's where we started to see um, um, uh, some issues. More, a number of businesses are really feeling it. And the most obvious ones that have been feeling it are those dealing with discretionary um, discretionary consumer spending. Now, all this sounds quite, quite pessimistic. Consumers are spending less because they've got less income. Businesses are starting to feel the pain from that. Right? So these are all the reasons about why growth has been subtrend and why the first half of this year will be at least, the first half of 2024 will be at least as uh, weak in terms of the economic growth as the second half of 2023. That's not all negative, right? So the first bit is, if you actually ask workers, do you expect you know, lots of closed downs, downsizing, redundancies, or whatever, however you want to term it, the number of people expecting that is really low. Now, that number likely will rise over the course of 2024 as businesses slow a little bit, but it is very, very low. And one of the reasons it's very, very low and likely to remain very, very low is that businesses have just had two or three years. The tough, they face the toughest jobs market in 50 years. After facing the tough, toughest job market in 50 years, the first thing you're not going to do is get rid of people. 
right? You might employ less people, but the last thing you probably end up doing is get rid of the people that you currently got. So that's the first bit. We're, un we're unlikely to see widespread redundancies, I think, in this part of the economic cycle. Another good reason for optimism is, frankly, there's just so much to do in this economy. Right. If you actually add up all the building work, whether it be residential construction or non-residential construction, engineering, building bridges, building mines, whatever it might be, do that relative to the size of the economy, that is at its highest level apart from the biggest mining boom Australia's ever seen. We have just got so much work to be done and the biggest constraint a lot of people in mining, uh, manufacturing, uh, constructions had is just trying to get people. So the extent that there's any sort of slowing from some sectors economy, some people can go and work in construction or whatever, and that'll help those sectors do the things that they need to do. And more generally, if you just sort of think about what we need to do in this economy, we need to build more homes, we need to build more infrastructure, there's got to be climate change. All those things say that there's plenty of work out there not only to do today, but there will be to do in, um, in, coming, in coming quarters to come, coming years to come. And finally, I mentioned before about different government payments and so forth. This is sort of an economics concern, government consumption spending. But one of the things that's driven that up very aggressively over the last 10 years is programs like the NDIS. So actually, instead of giving us payments, the government is making the payment itself out to the providers. And what that has increased very, very strongly. And when, if you think about a lot of the discussion that we're having um, throughout the economy, it's about incre increasing resources to the so-called care economy, aged care, child care, NDIS, et cetera. So this is likely to remain a growth area for a while. Then there's the point I was making earlier on. Like, so what was the big issues confronting our economy? It was household disposable incomes. One of the big things that was hitting it, as I said, was that inflation tax. And I touched on the inflation tax come down. It was at eight, it, was four, it came down to four, now it's in the threes. At a minimum, I think we'll get down to three to three and a half percent. In fact, if you look at the sort of run rates, monthly, quarterly run rates, it does say that's essentially where we are. If you look at what's happening globally, virtually all inflation globally is getting to that much. And one of the things that stands out from the chart is it's been a very synchronised inflation cycle this time around because it's been a very similar trends that's caused inflation. So I expect inflation to be lower, which is actually obviously puts more spare cash in the people's pockets. One reason to be optimist, more optimistic in the second half of the year. Another one, it's so one issue to be constrained that inflation is about how quick it will slow from the three to three and a half percent mark. And if you look at that uh, charts on the right hand side from the RBA, you'll note from virtually all economies, there has been some sluggishness. Once you get down to three, it seems to be a little bit harder to get it down because those service sector economies are still dealing with the lags impact of higher inflation. Think an insurance company, you know, car insurance. All of a sudden, it's still paying the higher labour costs, the higher goods costs to repair a car. Uh, and because of all those things, the premiums are still going up. And so it's that lagged impact we're still seeing in the service sector about why it's been harder to get inflation down globally. It's likely to be why it's been harder to get down here. So one reason to be optimistic on is the consumer will be better because of the lower inflation tax. Another one is the tax cuts, right? Uh, I mentioned that was sort of one of the big negatives. That's all of a sudden going to go from negative in the first half of the year to a positive for the second half of the year. Right? And you, with that positive, then it's a question about how much would that be spent? Because that's a big question. After your last tough one or two years, do you want to rebuild your kitty for all the money you've spent the last year or two? And this is where the government's changes, the tax cuts come in. A lot of it originally was going to high income earners, people that typically, as the chart suggests, would save about 40% of income. Now, they're skewing a lot to the lower end, whereas if you average those other four lots of income, it's around about 15 or 20%, which says to you a whole lot more money of the tax cuts is likely to be spent. And at least according to my back of the NBO calculations, it will add about 0.1% of GDP. So what this means is that, first of all, the big negative for our the Australian economy, household disposable income, has gone from a big negative and as we get into through this year, it's going to become a positive. And because of the way the tax cuts are changed, uh, well, generally, then more of that will be spent. When you add in the fact there's all that work to be done, add in the fact that fiscal policy looks like it's going to be more supportive, add in the fact that uh, financial markets very strongly believe interest rates globally will be declining as, as we go into the second half of the year, that all suggests to me that the economy will be picking up uh, as we go into the back end of 2024, and I think we'll be stronger again as we go into 2025. What does all this mean uh, for interest rates? One of the really interesting, surprising questions that I received in 2023 is, uh, is the mortgage rate going to go back up to 17.5%? Right? 
Now, I was shocked when I first got that question. I thought there's just no way in the world we can get a mortgage rate of 7.5% where we are today. Um, but the reason, of course, is that a lot of people asking that once upon a time dealt with 7.5% mortgage rates. And they dealt with that in 1990. And what 1990 stands out because that was the last time we had an 8% inflation rate, which is exactly what we had in 2022. So when you think about it, it's not that silly a question. And my answer to that question was a 7.5% mortgage rate didn't ha happen in 1989, didn't happen because of something that happened in 1987. The 7.5% mortgage rate happened because of something that happened in the early 1970s. Because in the early 1970s, inflation went up, interest rates went up, then all the color economy started to slow. But when they reduced interest rates, inflation hadn't fallen enough. So next time the economy picked up, inflation went up even higher. So they put up interest rates even higher. Then the economy started to slow, but they didn't allow inflation to come down enough. So the next time the economy picked up, inflation went up higher, and that circle kept on going until we had 7.5% interest rates by 1989. And it is this chart that the central banks got very much in mind. They do not want this to happen again which is the reason why all central banks, including our own, have been very, very cautious. Yes, they can see the economy slowing. Yes, they can see the inflation is coming down, but they do not want to make that mistake that they made in the 1970s again, which is the reason why they want to be absolutely certain that inflation will be in the twos or very close to the twos before they'll be cutting interest rates. So what does this practically mean for interest rates? So the first one is the economy is slowing, but it's still doing okay. Inflation is coming down, but it might take a while to get into the 3% mark. And that global backdrop is very, very similar. That says to me, I would not be expecting any rate cuts in the first half of the year. In fact, I would not be expecting a rate cut until the earliest, until the end of 2024. And it may not be even until early 2025 till we actually get the first one. The second one is, I spoke about all the work that, um, that needs to be done. I spoke about the additional fiscal support. I spoke about the additional uh, income that households are likely to get. All those things by itself should mean the economy's better. And all those things mean you're unlikely to need to reduce interest rates uh, significantly in this economic cycle. So our current cash rate is 435. If you look where financial markets were pricing just a week or so ago, they suggested that the cash rate might only go come down by about three quarters of a percentage point in this cycle. Maybe it's a little bit more, but unlikely to be a whole lot more. So look, that's um, it overall from, from my standpoint. Uh, Angelina, what I would sort of say is overall, the US economy has done very strong. It's been the pillar of, of the global economy for last year. I expect 2024 to be decent, but not quite as good. Uh, the Chinese economy is struggling. We'll have some serious questions over the next three to five years. But I think there's still some uh, good news to be had for its economy, but on a longer time frame. And the Australian economy, I think there are better times to be coming ahead. I think we'll start to see them in the back end of uh, 2024 and more clearly uh, next next year. I might leave it there, uh, Angelina, and I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, absolutely, Peter. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. You actually answered a few questions I have, but I do have some questions for you. Uh, the first one being, markets remain focused on where interest rates are heading with global and Australian inflation remaining elevated versus the uh, central bank's targets. Do you believe the RBA, the Fed, and the rest of the world's central banks are in control of inflation at this juncture? Yes, I think, I'm, I'm, Angelina, I, think I might have mentioned my um, presentation that you know inflation was eight at the end of 22. It was four in Australia at the end of 23, and we'll certainly get down to the low to mid threes um, sometime by mid-year or slightly afterwards. So the first bit is inflation is coming down um, a, a fair bit. The second thing I sort of say is you look what central banks have been saying. So they were caught wrong-footed, to be fair, as most were in 21 and 22. But if you look what they've been saying now for the best part of at least 12 months, not only the RBA, but all central banks. And they've been saying a very similar story that will take us a while to get inflation back to where we want it to be, which is sort of in the, in the, in the twos. It'll take a while. And basically, financial markets want to be aggressive. So get it down now. Get it down now. Um, but it's been very hard for the, some of the reasons I actually touched on. So I don't think they've uh, they've lost control of it. I think they've been very cautious. I think they've actually had a, a pretty good uh, feel or pulse of inflation for the last year or so. And I think that their forecasts actually are pretty good. So financial markets are currently very confident they'll get inflation back to the twos next year. I think mm -hmm. they've, they're right to have that confidence. Yep, yep. And how much inflation do external factors such as the uh, what's called the... Uh, energy and commodity supply constraints have uh, over the direction of global inflation. Are there any external factors that you believe pose a noteworthy upward risk to global inflation at this point in time? 
Yeah, so it's it's been an interesting question. That um, when inflation first ticked up, the consensus among central banks is, well, look, you know, this sort of commodity price inflation just lasts about five minutes and goes because that has been the experience for the best part of 30 years. But of course, there were two things. First of all, those supply problems, you know, the Russia-Ukraine war being an obvious example, last a lot longer than most of those commodity price constraints um, have been. And the second of all, we had that exactly at the same time as we had all the supply demand problems associated with the pandemic. Now, many, not all, many, but not all uh, of the of the problems that we had associated with the pandemic, you know, too much demand, not enough supply of workers and materials, many of those are now gone, right? So that one issue is no longer there. Um, a lot of some of the issues associated with the commodity markets are nowhere near as severe it was. A lot of people would talk about, you know, issues with, um, you know, Red Sea transport and all, all that sort of stuff. It's a bit of a, a bit of an issue. To me, I think if I was going to sort of say the one thing I'd watch out for, and maybe there might be some sort of supply thing I'm not watching. But to me, I think the, the biggest thing I'd watch out for is will the economy over the next one to two years be stronger than we think? If it's stronger than we think, then that might create the, in, the inflation problem. So I think it might we, our, our, our inflation scare, if we're going to have one, is more likely to come from the demand side than the supply side. Mm. Despite higher interest rates, unemployment remains low in Australia. Why has employment been so resilient so up to this date? Is there a risk of a lagged impact of higher interest rates on the unemployment rate? So there's no doubt, Roy Angelina, that um, the unemployment rate has risen. So we're up about um, half a percentage point from its low. Um, and if you use some other indicators, it's probably slowed a little bit more than that. So A, it, um, the jobs market isn't as strong as it um, once was. But why is it still in a pretty good state? Like 4% unemployment rate, which is where we are, that was the low, the last economic cycle. Right, so we were at the lowest in 50 years. Now we're near the closest in 50 years. So it's still very, very strong. You know, we we have not seen a jobs market as strong as we had, as I mentioned, for 50 years. So the first bit, we started from such a strong standpoint that, yes, we've been slowing. And the other big thing is you haven't touched on, but is the amazing increase in the number of workers we've had over the last year or two because of the big increase in population growth. So high increase in supply of workers, reduced demand. That's the reason why the unemployment rates picked up a little bit. I think as the economy slows a little bit more over the course of 2024, an unemployment rate of four will go somewhere in the mid fours. I think that would probably be the case. But if we look back in you know, 10 years' time and sort of see, well, the worst of the economic uh, unemployment rate in this economic cycle was 4.5%, that's a pretty good outcome. You know, When we ended the pandemic, our unemployment rate was in the fives. So we end up in the slowest bit of the economic cycle, a uh, peak of four and a half. That'll be pretty good. Now, with the number of unemployed Australians per job vacancy running at only 1.5 times, which isn't too far above the 1.1 times pandemic low, does this suggest that the employees have enough wage negotiation power to push for higher wages this year and beyond? And if not, what's stopping them? Yeah, so... If we look at the parts of the economy that are most sensitive to the economic cycle, so, you know, if you look at the most, the you know, wages price index is the best measure of wages growth in the Australian economy. The last uh, reading of that showed that government workers received a big wage rise. One of the reasons was that in 2022, a bit, uh, fair bit of 2023, they weren't getting much at all. So they're doing a bit of a catch up. Whereas the part of the economy most sensitive um, to the changes in the economic cycle, the private sector, we're starting to see some slowing. In, um, in for wages growth in, in that part of the economy. So I think th that um, uh, we'll see sort of wages growth not decline sharply, but from here on in sort of sl slow modestly as we go through 2024. Not big time, but slow, slow modestly. I think an interesting question, Angelina, though, is given we had the um, tightest, toughest, strongest, whatever term you want to use, jobs market in 50 years, we had the highest inflation rate in 30 years, why was our wages growth only a bit over 4%? Because if you actually actually go back to the 1990s, we had 45 to 5% um, wages growth. So why wasn't it quite as strong um, as that? And, you know, to me, there might be various reasons. I think one of them was in the previous decade, people were getting wages growth in the threes. So all of us getting something to get in the fours was, um, was pretty big. The second one is, you know, yes, we talked about where inflation rate was and so forth. But the fact that if you look at a number of enterprise bargains, 
by the time they get to the third year, they expected slower wages growth. They actually requested that. And that was an expectation that wages, the inflation rate would go back um, to where we were. And I suspect maybe a third one would be, you know, quite a few people got quite large debt. And if you've got quite large debt, you want to make sure you've got a job to pay off that debt. And so, therefore, you want a higher wage rise. You know, you, you're facing some tough cost of living challenges, et cetera. You've got a tight jobs market, but you want to make sure you've got a job. And I think that sort of caution about wanting to have a job given your high debt level sort of constrains about how much you might, might, might want to push things. Are there any non-consensual Australian economic outlook scenarios you believe warrant greater attention by investment markets? Yeah, probably the biggest one I'd touch on is, you know, I already mentioned it a little bit, and one that's sort of getting increasing focus <clears throat> more, most particularly in the US. Um, and that is sort of, we've got a backdrop whereby that inflation tax is disappearing. Um, governments wanting to provide a reasonable amount of support to economies. So you've got the economy doing a pretty, a, a, quite a reasonable sort of state. And I suppose the whole question is, if the economy is so strong, right, reasonable, how much, if at all, do central banks need to reduce interest rates? Now, I already I touched on in my presentation that um, financial markets aren't expecting very modest rate reductions in Australia. But one of the reasons for that is our cash rate right now is at least a percentage point below most other ones. Right now, what happens if in the US their economy is pretty good, the inflation doesn't get much lower, do they have to reduce interest rates much at all? Right, and that's sort of uh, probably the open, an open question that if the economy doesn't slow much in the US, the amount of rate reductions that financial markets are currently expecting may not be there. So that's probably you know the most obvious one in 2024, given how well the US economy in particular is performing. But I have to say, many other economies, as we start 2024, has shown some better signs. The RBA famously surprised the market with its recent rate raising cycle, with which ran counter to its previous guidance. What are the chances of more surprises from the RBA looking forward? And if there are more rate surprises coming, in which direction are they more likely to surprise the markets? Yeah, so if you think back about why, what happened to the RBA? So essentially, inflation picked up a little bit. They sort of expected that would be. But first of all, it went a lot higher than they thought. They thought it'd go to 4 to 5%, ended up going to 8 Second of all, it wasn't up there for five minutes. It ended up being, well, it, it will end up being above their in a two to three percent target band for four years, right? So a lot higher for a lot longer. Um, so that's the reason why they got surprised and why their sort of promise, which, you know, wasn't really a promise, but anyway, uh, that's the reason why they were caught out. So the question, so when it comes through, are they going to be caught out again? Well, they get caught out if they get caught out by the data. Um, and which way could it go? Well, the previous your previous question touched on the one: what would happen if the economic growth was, you know, uh, was was strong, and therefore the inflation risks are not quite as low as what people were thinking. I suppose what would go the other way: how do you get even lower interest rates? That would mean that economic growth would have to be a lot weaker. But um, if you think about how people are financial markets are pricing things and how people are forecasting, very few people right now are expecting a very weak economic environment. So that's good news, of course. But if we did do that, you know, that would obviously have implications in terms of the economy and financial markets more generally. If and when the RBA starts cutting rates, how do you expect the equity, bonds and property markets will respond? Well, the residential property market hasn't waited. <laughs> They've already fired the gun. Uh, even before rate cuts, they're up, they're, they're often running in terms of how well house prices are going up. Um, how do I, how do I think equity? So basically, financial markets have touched on is pricing three to four rate cuts. So we get three to four rate cuts in line with what's um, and sort of okayish economic growth. That's basically the scenario that uh, financial markets are pricing. So I would suggest that the equity bond market implications would be relatively modest. You know, obviously there'd be some positive bond yields go down a little bit, equity markets rally a little bit, but I think a lot of that is largely in the markets. As I mentioned, the the, the scenarios where basically you get big changes is one if rate cuts go a lot more, a lot lower, but does that require substantially weak economic growth? The alternative is the economic growth is a lot stronger, but you don't get the interest rate cuts you think. So they're the ones that sort of really could challenge. Uh, current financial market pricing. You know, where financial markets really like, of course, is that if inflation went down, but economic growth stayed strong. That's the absolute mm -hmm. Nevada, but I think that's probably the least likely scenario. Mm 
With equity markets having climbed a world of worry in recent months, do you believe local equity investors have become too optimistic about the local and global economic outlook? Yeah, I think the the, the big <clears throat> um, story of 23 in terms of people's forecasts is that many people had a recession, not so much for Australia, but certainly for the US, um, that there'd be a recession, right? And, um, you know, that recession risk, given how strong the US economy has been, the global economy more generally, uh, it's essentially been taken out of financial markets. So because there's no absolute really bad downside, and this is most of the rate reductions that were expected at the start of the year are still there. You've got interest rates coming down a lot. You have you've got sort of an okay, still a decent economic growth background. The combination of better economy, uh, lower interest rates is the reason why uh, equity markets have done pretty well over the last, particularly the last three months. So you know if you're going to get a change from that, um, it would be if, if the economy is weaker. As I as I've touched on a couple of times, it's really that combination of. Um, what the economic growth outlook is versus the interest rate outlook. It's the combination of the two that really does matter. Thanks, Peter. Now, to conclude, can you please share a standout investment or economic lesson you've learned of late in your position as Bank of Queensland's chief economist? Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll learn a lesson a week, so um, try, try, <laughs> try, try to remember the last one. Look, probably the biggest one I was going to say is relearning an old lesson. Right. So essentially for um, 25 years, the main driver of uh, where the economy was going, the ups and downs, the cycle, if I can use that term, the main driver of the economic cycle was monetary policy. Um, a lot of the questions you touched on you know, have been involved in that. You know, Is central banks going to cut rates? What's the driver and all those sorts of things? And so that's been typically the driver of the economy and, and where financial markets have been going. If I think about um, the local economy, but more generally um, all economies over the last three years, in, you know, what's happening by the central banks has sort of mattered, but by overwhelmingly, the biggest driver has been fiscal policy. I touched on in that my discussion on the US. You know, why has the US economy been the strongest of the lot? Well, one of the biggest reasons is the, they've had the most massive support from fiscal policy. If you think about um, our economy, why have we done quite well? It's not only the federal government, but virtually all the state governments have been spending up big time, whether it be supporting consumers or doing a whole lot of infrastructure work. And so that, remember, you know, if you went back prior to the 1990s, uh, everyone used to focus on the budget as the biggest driver of where the economy and financial markets were going. And slowly that sort of fell out of use as people turned to uh, central banks. What we'll have to do in the future is look at what governments do. That's going to be important, as well as what central banks do. Thank you, Peter, for the presentation. It's been really wonderful. Really appreciate. We look forward to seeing you again. Thanks very much, Angela, for the invite. I appreciate being here.